giving you a voice, and making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archive FIRST Robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Hello, everybody, and welcome to First Updates Now. We have a very special show uh, for you tonight, uh, talking about uh, and expanding upon what teams are doing and uh, how they can uh, get involved and help with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and we have some amazing panelists that we brought in here today uh, from the healthcare industry and the medical device field industries to discuss uh, unique challenges facing their industries and what's going on with that. And uh, I'd love to hear, you know, just from uh, these uh, amazing people uh, how they're tackling these challenges. And, you know, we think about, you know, firsters as you are uh, uh, in high school right now or in college or beyond, that these are real uh, professions you can get into uh, coming from first uh, and uh, really want to talk more about what goes on with this. So reporting for first updates now, I'm Tyler Olds. And uh, as mentioned, I want to introduce these amazing minds that we have here this evening. Uh, they go through and, and talk about things in more further detail. Uh, so we'll get to know a bit more about them and your industries, but let's just do a brief introduction. Uh, let's start off by welcoming uh, Dr. Joe Johnson, who's an engineer from Form Labs. Uh, and if you're an old school firster like me, uh, Dr. Joe goes back a long ways on the original Chief Delphi, both the website and the team uh, as well, too. So uh, uh, Dr. Joe, love to hear just uh, what team are you on right now and uh, welcome to the show. So I'm currently with uh, Team 88 out of yeah. Bridgewater, Mass and uh, TJ Squared, and we uh, we're, you know, riding this out like everyone else. I, uh, I currently work at Form Labs, a uh, 3D printing company. We've made a, um, uh, a, a big effort uh, to figure out ways that the 3D printing industry can kind of, kind of answer the bell for this COVID-19. Uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, basically I'm working on developing 3D printing to make it more accessible to more people, driving the price down like we did with Form 2. Form three, and I'm working on a company on a product called Fuse, uh, basically bringing first kind of engineering to like what do you do to make a an additive manufacturing technology. Awesome, and uh, thank you for that. And we'll dive a bit more into it because I really want to hear more about Form Labs as well too. Uh, let's also welcome uh, the vice president of global development. Uh, you're gonna have to explain some of these acronyms to me, by the way, too, uh, Jerry. G M I M T uh, at Striker. So welcome, uh, Jerry, and also uh, you're on Strike Force, a legendary team in the first community. No, it's it's great to be here, and uh, I've been involved with Strike Force for about seven years at this point. We've had a, a pretty successful run, and. Pretty excited about the future. Uh, it was a little bit disappointing how this year finished up, but it's reality. Hmm. Who would have thought it? Global pandemic. No, when you say but, finish, do you mean the decapitated robot head, or you just mean the season in general for you guys? <laughs> the uh, it, if if our job was to create a highlight reel, I think we got that box checked. You made ours a few <laughs> times, so <laughs> that's right. The, uh, probably the most proudest moment is 45 minutes after that event. That robot was back on the floor and uh, set a record match score. So we're uh, pretty happy with what the kids pulled off there. But uh, now my day job, I've been at Stryker for now three decades and spent a lot of time sorting out what we do at Stryker, big medical multinational uh, uh, machine there. But we, we play in a lot of places in medicine. So this COVID thing has been a, a very, very close thing to what we do for a living. But a lot of my background has really been pushing the envelope on technology. If you back up probably uh, to 2003, 2004, um, I was probably the first person to start talking about surgical robotics inside a striker. And today that's a pretty big deal. Um, you fast forward to today, and I think you got the picture up there. One of the uh, more interesting things that we did for COVID was this emergency relief bed. And that's a fascinating story that we'll perhaps talk a little bit more uh, later in the uh, the broadcast here. Absolutely. Uh, and not to mention, we got one of our own here. Uh, but. <laughs> 
for those of you who don't know, you know, Mike's obviously huge for us and fun, uh, but a lot of people don't know. This is actually a registered nurse and nursing instructor uh, at the College of Brockport State University of New York. That's a long phrase, by the way, Mike. Uh, please welcome <laughs> in uh, Mike Stark. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Yeah, thanks guys for having me. Um, yeah, so the, the uh, I guess the acronym for that is SUNY. So I work at SUNY Brockport okay. State University of New York. Um, yeah, I was a, a student and mentor on Team 340 for a while. I haven't been involved uh, with the FRC top 25 and fun now for 10 years or something like that. And yeah, yeah just really excited to be here um, with Joe and Jerry. I saw Form Labs present, I think, at the Founders Reception or something at Championship years and years ago. Started following them on, on social media and just the prints and stuff that come out of Form Labs machines are just second to none, in my opinion, just uh, from what I've seen. And then, yeah, just working in the medical field. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about my job and stuff. But yeah, I've, I've worked with Striker products for a long time now. So great to be here with Jerry. And uh, yeah, looking forward to a great show. I think this is going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. And don't forget, uh, chat, we'd love to hear from our live chat here. If you do have any questions or comments uh, for any of our panelists here or, or anything you want to he hear talk about during the show, tag at first updates now so we can grab those. Uh, we might not get to them immediately, but we will get them to them, I promise you, sometime during the show uh, as we go through. So once again, tag at first updates now if you're part of the live chat uh, so we can get to those as well, too. Uh, with that said, I, I do want to ask a little bit more and dive into uh, your careers and what's going on for that. And maybe we'll end up previewing later in how your career is impacted by this. But let's kind of start with the basics here. Uh, Dr. Joe, let's start with you. Uh, you know, you're at Form Labs. You've been part of uh, pre-show we were talking. You've been part of, what, seven first teams throughout your career uh, <laughs> as well, too. Yeah. And uh, just love to hear how did you get initially involved uh, in what you're doing right now? Because you've had quite the journey going all the way through. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I often say I'm an escapee from the auto industry. I mean, I, sure. uh, I loved my work in the auto industry, but it was, uh, it was really stressful, you know, going through basically the, the two decades leading up to all the bankruptcies. So, uh, I kind of got through first, I got the, the in love with robots sort of thing and, uh, eventually moved out here to Boston to work for iRobot. And, uh, uh, from iRobot, I went to a medical startup actually. TJ Squared's uh, one of their early drivers was uh, uh, one of the very early employees, like employee number two or something like that, at this medical startup. And uh, um, so he he you know convinced me to leave and join there. And that's kind of why I'm here tonight is because I have some medical experience. I mean, this much, but it's better than zero. And uh, then uh, uh, I uh, I've uh, joined. Form Labs two years ago, uh, and uh, it's just been you know bringing 3D printing to you know to uh, uh, the, not exactly the next level because there are there are printers that can do bigger, there are printers that can do you know faster. There there's lots of but but at this price point, it's just a really mm -hmm. it's a it's so fun to be able to make products that out of these the, like I. I uh, it's part of part of everybody who works at Forum Labs can make infinite prints. That's literally like in your offer, you're like infinite prints. And so <laughs> I'm like always making prints, like three or four prints a night, sort of a sort of a thing. So oh, that's awesome. Um, so what are you anyway, printing right really, now? Really, really, really fun, huh? What are you printing right now? Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's kind of a a, a, a discussion around uh, diff swerve. And I have been working on a stealth version of differential swerve that uh, I am so excited about, but I don't <laughs> want to start. I don't want to derail us, but sure. yeah, I, uh, differential swerve, I think, is going to be so easy and so cool uh, that basically people will decide to do it. Well, that might, that might be something we need to talk about on a future show as well. Another too, show, bring, yes. Because that, so, that sounds pretty amazing. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, so impacting, like, this is, I guess, one of the things that I feel a little bit, maybe uh, there's always this imposter syndrome going around where you feel like maybe I'm not worthy, but, like, mm. what am I doing mostly for COVID? And, you know, I think my first job is, like, I'm 60, like, don't take up one of those beds that somebody else is going to need. So, like, keeping myself from getting sick is uh, is one of those things that, mm. uh, you know, because even though the odds aren't that great that some bad outcome is going to happen for me. Um, and I'm not necessarily afraid of that, but me not being afraid of it doesn't mean that I'm not going to be taking up a bed that somebody else would need. So, you know, this whole like flattening the curve idea is really, really important. And, um, 
you know, so taking care of, you know, being able to like do your small part. Uh, and it isn't always about me. It's like, you know, 10,000 more people like me or, you know, whatever. There are 4 million 60 year olds, right? If all 4 million of us all roll our dice, we can take up all the beds we got, right? So we have sure. to like, we have to take those dice and, you know, erase some of the ones and twos and get those all to be higher numbers so that nobody, you know, fewer people end up rolling snake eyes so that we don't end up having this, you know, so, you know, th this idea of like risk, it's really bringing, I, I love the first community because you can talk to them in terms of like, this is a probability problem. This yeah. isn't necessarily like a personal risk problem. This is a societal risk about, I mean, yes, you can be afraid if you're in certain groups, it's really, really dangerous. If you know your, if your, your grandma and a bunch of other people who could possibly be sick, you know, worry for them. And you should really worry about society because with so many people rolling these dice, we can so easily end up with, even if it isn't any one roll of the dice isn't very risky. There's just so many dice being rolled that it's almost certain a bad outcome happening. And that's the thing that really, you know, has been something that it's been trying to communicate to our team about like, why do we have to stop doing first? Why can't we just go to this? Why can't this one? Well, because it isn't just this one. It's uh -huh. it's all yeah. of, you know, we have to do all these things that if we all do them, we can take these risks down to the level that we can all take our roll of the dice and we can have enough of us will, you know, a, a, a small enough number of us will not overwhelm our medical system because that really has been like the enorm the, the big uh, the big insight that people need to understand is that you're doing it for a societal collapse problem and. Right. And I, and I think we'll jump in a bit a bit more into that as well, too. I do just want to uh, bring up the comment. You, you brought differential swerve in. Uh, uh, C. McBride says, if 88 goes swerve, any will be toast. So I think they're looking forward to that as well, too, there, Joe. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, you know, the topics you bring out, I, I think we'll dive a lot more into this as well, sure. too. Sure, yeah. But you know, I, I'm a little bit rambling. So that's all right. I, um, I, I just want to future things. Yeah. But, yeah. I just want to bring uh, 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 Jerry in here to talk a little bit more uh, in regards to uh, you're, you mentioned being a striker for a very long time uh, and with Strike Force for a while too. Uh, can you tell me a little about uh, Strikers' involvement? Obviously, a leading medical technology company, but uh, how did you get involved in what you're doing right now? And then uh, you were not a first student and not in first originally. Nope. So what what dragged you into being part of Strike Force? Now, the from a striker standpoint, uh, I've been there 30 years, so clearly. I like my job. I like my job a lot, and uh, and have done a lot of R and D leadership over the years there. And ultimately, today I lead a group of folks. You can kind of think of us. We incubate the future, from really a technology standpoint, from a market analytics standpoint. We try to figure out where Striker's supposed to be in five or ten years, and then do something about it, and have that all queued up for the commercial division. So I have an unbelievably cool job. Yeah, and as as far as strikers' involvement, it, very interesting times. Clearly, we're pretty close to all of this, and there are two major product lines that, that we're involved in that are very relevant. Uh, one of our divisions very focused on patient beds, and uh, you popped up an image here of the emergency bed. And as we worked with the government officials and said, okay, what can we do to help? One of the big asks was, we need beds. And so we did a little analysis of all of our different bed lines. And when you look at what it would take to crank up the volume to a meaningful level, you weren't going to do it. And so this emergency bed is an example of a bunch of folks looking at a variant of a bed we make in a different, different country for a different market and saying, you know what? If we did this, that, and the other, we could basically turn this into an Ikea-style bed. And the key thing was it had instant scale. We oh. plan to build 100,000 of these. And uh, this bed went from zero to beds rolling off the production line in two weeks. And oh. that includes FDA wow. approval. Oh. Being in this industry, that's just mind blowing. Yeah. And an example of some of the crazy stuff that happened, they kind of got the design sorted out in a matter of days. And if you're going to make this many, you need a lot of steel. So we called all the steel mills in the U.S. and said, what do you got in stock? redesigned the thing around that and said, we'll take it all. <laughs> and of a particular type of steel, we bought everything in captivity in the U.S. And that's what it takes to do this. We're very, very proud of what's achieved there. And we are now, as of last week, shipping beds, and we're headed toward shipping 2,000 a day. Wow. And to hey, go can from... I ask a question about the yes. FDA approval? So did you guys have to, like, 
uh, did you follow your normal, like you have a, a certain certification for following, you know, for, you know, ISO, blah, blah, blah. Did you have to follow all that? Or were you guys like saying, okay, because it's an emergency, we're doing something different because two weeks of FDA approval, like that, that's really, really something. I mean, I believe from amazing. the time we told the FDA what we were doing to the time they said you're good to go was about 48 hours. We did follow our normal design procedures, wow. but things that normally take months, you were clicking off in a matter of five hours. And nice. so it's, uh, and there were, I mean, we did follow process and procedure, but it's an example. Something like this lets you really stretch the envelope of what's theoretically possible if there's serious consequences of not getting it done. So it's, uh, it, we will learn from this, and this will probably impact how we do some things in the future. But very, very proud of that. Um, Stryker also has been participating uh, with a, a hospital out in New York, Mount Sinai, on trying to engineer how they split these ventilators. And so we've been pretty involved in that, too, but not at the same scale of this bed. That This bed thing's a massive program, and we're spinning up production in several places in the U.S. Have these been shipped out already, or have some yeah. of them been rolling off the lines? Oh, I mean, yeah. Where, like, are they U.S.? Are they going globally? Where are, they, where are we seeing these transferred to? Uh, so far, everything, I believe, is to the U.S., and I know a, a number of them went out to New York. They've, they've sure. got quite an ordeal they're working on out there. And as we crank up the volume, they'll end up going all over the place. And, and part of the key is enough beds fast enough you know shipping five beds is not going to change anybody's mm -hmm. world shipping two thousand a day might sure and mike i, I want to bring you into this here and ask you a couple things one mike's from upstate new york originally uh as well too we're obviously well, new york yeah, state western yeah uh, yeah so well to me that's if it's not new york city that's upstate, well i think right? we used to say upstate but upstate is actually like kind of uh, upstate of New York City. Gotcha. So, okay. Yeah, I've been starting. To so all of New York. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so no, but I do want to do want to ask you on that is that obviously New York State's been very heavily impacted by COVID-19. Uh, and uh, as you look into, you know, your profession as a nursing instructor now, I'm sure you have your students asking lots of questions on things. Uh, what do you see most commonly coming up from them? Uh, how, and how did you see that impact? And then lastly, um, you're a first alumni. I don't think many first alumni think about going into a nursing profession or, or many yeah. medical professions. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about that? Yeah, so let me, I'll start there first, I guess. So um, I loved my time on the robotics team. Uh, I was a welder, I was a mechanical driver, um, all sorts of that. And I just did not think, you know, engineering was a path that I wanted to go, but um, kind of the roundabout way I ended up in nursing. I love working with um, children. Uh, so I ended up in pediatric nursing for like, so we call it bedside nursing. Uh, so when you're actually doing, you know, the daily care in the hospital, so that's bedside. So I was a bedside pediatric nurse for about two years, two and a half years. And then I made the switch. I went to the pediatric operating room um, where I was exposed to, like I said earlier, kind of a lot more of the striker products and stuff like that. Uh, so then I was there for a while. So um, I always tell, you know, the youth at my church or just those that are looking for a path to take, I always suggest nursing. Um, nursing at one degree can take you um, a, a really uh, a lot of places. Uh, you can work with children, you can work with babies, you can work with adults, you can work with um, geriatrics, you can work in the operating room um, as a nurse, you can, uh, it just there's just so much. You can do uh, instructing like myself, <laughs> Tyler's uh, pulling some stuff up here. So We know um, each other personally, I can bring up your Facebook feed for stuff, so. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so. Um, as, so what the program that I teach in, it's not a normal undergraduate um, uh, program that I teach in. So you can get your associate's degree or bachelor's degree in nursing. Uh, it's the same job when you graduate. You take the same nursing boards. Uh, I think there is sometimes some pay differential, stuff like that. However, in New York State, um, legislature went through several years ago saying, you, you know, you can still get your associate's in nursing. However, um, you can... Uh, they, you know, you need to go back and get your bachelor's degree within 10 years of graduating or those that were already had their associate's degree needed to go back to school. Um, so I teach in that program. So my, my, uh, my students are kind of unique. They're already practicing nurses, uh, that have their associate's degree that are going back for, um, their bachelor's. So I have a, a huge, um, dynamic of students. I have some that are, have been nurses for 20 plus years. I have some that have just graduated from nursing school and have just started their first job. Um, so I have most most nurses in the Western New York area where um, where our school is located. Uh, however, there are a lot um, there are we have so we have a lot of students that work in in New York City. Uh, another side note is my wife is a nurse as well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, she works in a cardiac ICU, in, uh, intensive care, cardiac intensive care, um, and she does travel nursing. So we've been around the country the, the last year and a half. We've been doing that. So this is our, we're currently in Phoenix. So yeah, so um, so I've kind of, I don't, I'm not in the, the direct front lines anymore, but I have heard from obviously my wife who's working and from students who are kind of in New York City and still have some contacts back home that I, I've talked about. So yeah, there's just a lot has changed. Um, you know, there's, there's just been a lot um, that the nurses have been dealing with. A lot of policy changes, um, just as things have come out, you know, the use of masks, the not use of masks, uh, stuff like that. So um, just that nurses are always a resilient, or nurses and, and healthcare workers are a resilient group, um, having to really adapt daily to the, to the new recommendations or or um, stuff like that. So what was your other question? I'm sorry. Um, what else can I touch on? Well, for me, I think we'll let's let's pause there and we can jump into a little bit more in a bit. Uh, I do want to give a couple of just brief announcements and thank yous real quick. Uh, Connor McBride coming in with 2000 bits says stay healthy, folks. Uh, and if you haven't seen, we do have a uh, new uh, Twitch uh, subscription uh, notification that comes up. Uh, we had uh, both Cal, Caltrain and Mike actually uh, clipped out a very uh, rustic photo of Dean Kamen, uh where he's, he's got quite the uh, uh, quarantine beard going on right now. I uh, am with a little can of Reeves, you're breathtaking. So it's only supposed to work for resubs, but I think it's working for everybody right now. But test it out. We'd love to, you know, if you, if you got the Twitch Prime sub, we'd love to have you do that uh, as well, too. So um, do you want to jump in uh, and talk about a little bit more on, on industry impacts for, for things? We touched, I think, on some of this here. Uh, but, uh, Jerry, let's start with you on this. Uh, looking at, you talked about, you know, Stryker's gone and, you know, with the beds, they purchased a bunch of steel for things. But what about other operations in Stryker? How is uh, COVID-19 impacted operations, if at all, or are you, as a medical company, are you just overwhelmed right now with business or how does that kind of work from that standpoint? Well, it's kind of everything all at once. Uh, the first thing we did, we were about, I think a week and a half before Michigan pulled the plug and told everybody to stay home. Uh, we decided everybody out of the office. The goal was 90% of the employees no longer come into the office. And the goal was to protect those who had to come in and run production. Being in the medical product business, we knew we were not shutting things down. Mm -hmm. We're a major provider of PPE. You may have heard that. And so those lines, it's how hard can you run them? Around the clock, what can you do? And so parts of our business is just firewall everything and get as mm -hmm. creative as you can. Other product lines, a lot of our stuff's used for elective surgery. That's gone to zero. And so we have idled a lot of those lines and shifted those production people over to helping to make PPE and other things to the extent that you can. It's not a perfect utilization of resources. So it was really crank some things as hard as you can, idle other things. But uh, the big yank is we had 40,000 employees and we had 90% of those folks suddenly work from home. And that's actually going better than one would have hoped. And I think when all this is over, we're going to learn a couple of things uh -huh. about maybe we all don't need to be in the same room. Let me, let me hey, follow Jerry, up. Well, can I, can yeah, I go ahead, Mike. just for yeah. a second? Yeah. So I just wanted to touch on, cause you mentioned it and I just kind of want to bring that up. You said, you mentioned elective surgery. So that is something that I have um, heard. So I have friends back home in the operating room still. And my wife works on a cardiac intensive care where they take care of post-op patients. So elective surgeries are those surgeries that can wait. Um, so it's, it's just what it is. It's elective. Yeah. So it's not, it's not pressing. It's not emergent. So a lot of things that you, that you guys do is you do a lot of like joint, joint replacements yep. and some of those products along those lines where those surgeries have been put on pause. So yes. like you said, so you've been able to scale back those productions, uh, to then ramp up some other things. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Now the key yeah. is none of those people are magically getting better. Right. And so once we come out the other side of this, there's going to be a whole nother event, which is trying to catch back up exactly. with all the health care that's been put on hold to make room for for the covid folks. So, yeah, we're there's a long road here before we completely get out the other side of this. That's a great point, because even in even car, even believe it or not, some cardiac surgeries are elective, but sometimes can only be elective for so long. Yeah. Uh, where maybe somebody there's a valve in, in one of your valves in your heart needs a replacing. Now it can it can hold on, but like you said, Jerry, there's going to be a, like we my wife and I have talked about this, and you know nurses that she works with. There's there's going to there's kind of this lull where my wife has actually been called off probably about once a week for the last couple of weeks just because the, the census isn't mm -hmm. there. There's no there's no surgery patients. Um, 
and that, but at some point, all these patients, all these elective surgeries that have been put on on pause are going to kind of probably backlog at some point and uh, really ramp back up and, and cause some cause some some definite busyness coming up here. Yeah, I, yeah. I think you. I think that's a, a good point about you'd be surprised at what's considered elective. Like yeah. I know people that were you know in the process of donating kidneys, you know, like live donator donated kidney transfers that are like that's elective. Yeah. And so they're they're cleaning the they're clearing the decks again because they need capacity. So, um, yeah, this uh, this is there are going to be a lot of knock on effects. And how do we, how do we how do we come back alive after this you know kind of hibernation is going to be really yeah. unprecedented. Yeah. yeah, we're kind of seeing that in the staffing um, right now. A lot of like I said, my wife has been called off um, back home. You know, in the OR with my friends, you know, there's just not a lot of cases unless they're emergent cases. And um, we're, her contract is up here at the just at the beginning of May. So we're looking for next. And there was a bunch, they call them crisis jobs that were available. But those are kind of now that things are turning the corner a little bit, maybe flattening out and hopefully decreasing relatively soon. Um, on top of that, plus now that these units are not really that full, or a lot of some unit surgical units are really not that full, we're having a hard time finding her a placement. Um, whereas in maybe a month from now, then there'll be a whole bunch more coming up. So, but a really interesting, a really interesting time for staffing wise uh, for nurses. It was really like they needed all hands on deck for a while um, in certain areas and uh, certain like emergency rooms, stuff like that. Um, but other areas we're not seeing as, ma as many patients. And then, um, yeah, well, I think we'll see that ramp back up. So a really interesting time concerning healthcare staffing um, that has been really interesting for me to at least to see. Something I want to ask in regards to uh, staffing and also, uh, uh, Jerry, a follow-up for you. You mentioned that 90% of your staff is working from home, but 10% still working uh, somewhere in your facilities, right? So yep. how how are you and if anybody else wants to chime in, practicing social distancing for those who still have to work uh, or, or being safe, um, what preventive practices are you taking uh, on that standpoint at the workplace? Obviously, uh, you know, folks are masked, and I mean, there's a crazy amount of cleaning going on. When you, while this is mainly transferred through the air, you know, short term, I think it can be transferred on surfaces. So mm -hmm. it's everything you can imagine. You, those critical people are where they need to be. We have eliminated everybody from their environment that can possibly be eliminated and try to maintain distance between folks wherever that's physically possible, which is most places. And then it's just maintaining a pristine environment, enormous amount of effort going into that. And right now, if you were not feeling well and you showed up in a striker facility, you better be wearing an armor suit because mm -hmm. you are not a popular person because you're putting the whole machine at risk. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it has been coached pretty heavily. If you are feeling not even, you know, even a little bit off, stay out of the building. Yeah. So it's really just that corporate mandate and then just being as methodical as we can about everything in the environment to protect those that have to show up each day to keep cranking because it's PPE. That stuff's made by people. Mm -hmm. And Joe, I want to bring you in on that too. I, I, can you go through how big your workforce is and then uh, are you guys just all working from home for now or what's the situation uh, over at Form Labs? So Form Labs, uh, uh, we're in Massachusetts. So uh, Basically, the unless it's a um, uh, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, everything is is uh, work from home. But when we that did at the beginning, that wasn't the requirement. Uh, but Form Labs was pretty proactive, and uh, we have 500 people worldwide. Um, I think something three 350 are in the uh, Somerville in the Boston area, essentially. And um, within a complex of, you know, a block of each other. Uh, I think within a week or so, uh, we went to uh, everybody that can work from home, work from home. So the building went from, you know, 200 people in the building. I worked to like 20 people in a very, very short time. Uh, once the, the governor had the, the, uh, the, uh, the new order came out, we, it, I think there's still a couple, three people maybe in the building doing various things. It, it isn't, it isn't a lot. I, I, I've not been in, so I don't really know, mm -hmm. but I can infer from who's there. It, it might be like three people per team of which there's like three major teams that are More still than... uh, doing some work. There are people who are working on, on uh, protective, well, actually swabs. The big contribution that uh, Form Labs has uh, uh, been, uh, been active in is the, um, 
nasal swabs. There's a getting, uh, yeah, it, to say they're swabs, they're basically these sticks with like polyps on the end that you stick up your nose and it, it, it's kind of gross, but it does, it takes these samples. And uh, we've been working with a, uh, a hospital down in Florida to get them FDA approved. And we're making, I believe we have the capacity to make 100,000 a day at our mm. print farm out in Ohio. Um, and that I don't think we're actually up to that volume yet, but I think we're in the maybe half that volume, something like that. What constitutes uh, a but, print farm, by the way? <laughs> like how many, so, uh, how many printers are involved with something like that? I believe there are 200 printers mm. in, uh, in our print farm in uh, uh, Ohio. I, I should. I, I actually haven't been to the facility out there, but uh, we have uh, a big, a big part of our kind of uh, marketing and sales is that we, you know, we um, we make sample prints for people who are interested in buying our product, and so normally that's what they're doing. Sure. But uh, as it turns out, this facility makes some resins that are um, that are dental resins that can go inside your mouth and are 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 allowed are are. Uh, uh, I forgot what the word they they've they've been approved certified to be able to be to touch your your the, your skin because most of our resins uh, you can develop a, a reaction to them so if you you get uh, it just it isn't the kind of thing you want against your skin all the time so but there are a couple of resins that are our dental resins that are FDA approved and uh, so the facility that makes them has to be FDA approved and so that print farm sort of gets this halo effect of FDA approval. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get an exception in this case to be able to make these, uh, uh, these FDA approved uh, nasal uh, swabs for this hospital that's marketing them and selling them. So actually, I don't know the business end of it. All I know is we're making them and giving them to them. Uh, and uh, so we're using this dental resin that is, that is uh, safe to be able to be used. Uh, that's that's actually one of the, the interesting thing that a lot of people I know, they wanted to help and say, like, I'm going to 3D print masks or I'm going to 3D print something to um, like make more ventilators or I'm going to print. And uh, while I think a lot of it is is well intentioned and a lot of it was uh, like, yeah, if it ever got to like, you know, a Mad Max situation, we definitely would be using those sorts of things. But, you know, we uh, until we get to those those kind of like desperations, the FDA approval is a hospital just can't use them. So, you know, that's the thing I think was so impressive about uh, about what you uh, said about Jerry, about getting the FDA approval on the beds, you know, unbelievable. Like that is really um, just it. It, uh, it anyway, it, it to, to see a big company like Stryker, which, you know, I've done I've done development at a big company. I used to work for Delphi slash GM and you know, I know the normal route of development can be a little bit the tortoise and the hare sort of a situation. And to see you guys move so quickly, uh, yeah, that's impressive. So, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, we're very few people are working uh, in the building, just a very minimal shell. I mean, people are, are, are shifting to where some of them are coming in like at eight o'clock at night so that they don't have to, you know, be around any other people. There's a lot going on to... Uh, and it's interesting, it's gonna be a new world also because our company as a, as a kind of a scrappy startup that had a Kickstarter to get going, you know, we have kind of an allergic reaction to like working from home. And I think maybe we will start rethinking that with this because, you know, we haven't had a choice and we're doing some pretty good work, so. Yeah, I mean, companies have to continually adapt and I'll, I'll, I work for, uh, for those who don't know, I also work for a uh, ceramics company uh, and we've had to shut down our production lines for things. And the few of us who are able to work from home are able to do so, but obviously <coughs> big impacts on everybody, um, all the way around for that. So we appreciate hearing how companies are, are, uh, adapting to this and moving forward with it. Uh, we all have to move forward somehow. Um, and it's just kind of figuring out the, the way to do it. And some companies are able to have a little bit more of advantage than others for that. Uh, Mike, I want to ask you on this um, and, and bring up. Yeah. So when the first season canceled, um, you and I went on air um, to talk to you know our fans and people in first who were clearly hurting. Uh, but we know that first teams are resilient. Uh, we know uh, that they have a strong 
uh, drive to help and get things going. And I, and I think Dr. Joe mentioned a little bit about this in his last thing as well, too. But we've seen, you know, tons of posts from first teams uh, about what they're doing to, to help or try to help or get involved uh, for things. And I, I think a lot of it has been good stuff, but the Dr. Joe's point something might still be a little bit in vain as well, too, uh, or maybe just not directed towards the, the right way. So I'd love to open this up a bit more uh, and talk about how uh, we can do some positive things uh, as first teams if we're able to uh, in the community. So uh, what are some things that you would uh, recommend from that? And I'd love to hear from other people jumping in for that as well, too. Yeah, so we kind of, we, we did um, have that show a week or so ago, like you mentioned, and I think you like you said that was like a month ago already. <laughs> was it really? Yeah. I um, um, I think teams are well intentioned. They want to help. Um, you know, the, a lot of these teams have access to three D printers, and um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Uh, I think you know, try if you were to reach out on your own to hospitals, you're not. I don't. I don't think you would get in anywhere. You know, so teams. If there's still that need, I would research and find existing efforts that are that are um, actually seeking help. Um, I know there's a couple first uh, people in the first community who have or have been posting a lot about um, if you can help. Here's you know our plans that we've been doing, and they're going to go to these specific things. So uh, I wouldn't try to maybe pioneer anything on your own. I would I would hook up with something that's um, already going, and kind of just to to give you an insight of um, of what you're seeing with the kind of these full shield with these full masks and these full shields. Um, I, I believe those are mostly intended to protect the mask that is underneath. So these, you've heard these in the, in the news, these N95s. Um, so what these stand for, it's that these have a certain standard um, that they can filter 95% of what's in the air down to like 0.3 microns, point um, up to like 0.1 microns, somewhere in there. Um, these are, I, I believe are what, you know, the best at fighting um, these, um, airborne what's in COVID and there's certain there's certain precautions that you take depending on the disease so um, if you know somebody has a normal flu A flu B something like that there's there's different criteria of what needs to be worn so you've heard that there's been these shortages of these N95s so um, like my at my wife's facility currently she has been issued one uh, N95 where the shelf life of these are usually only about, I think what I've seen is like eight hours that you really only can wear them for about eight hours. Um, however, we, they just can't, you know, you, and should be for single patient use only. Um, but just with this, you know, the supply that's just not there. So they've had to get a little creative at what can you do to extend the life of these. So my friend back home has also said that they're reprocessing them. She doesn't really know what the, how they're doing that, the process of that, but that she puts hers in a paper bag and then it goes and gets reprocessed somehow and she gets hers back. Um, but the, the goal of these shields is that, that I think it's to protect that mask underneath so that that mask can be worn over and over and over again and you can go in between patients room with that. While then you can just, you can wipe down the mask and then reuse that. Um, it's easier to wipe down the plastic than, you know, to then have a, a different mask. So um, there's been, like I said earlier in the show, there's just been different Different things have come out before, like my wife has told has been told you can't wear, um, you know, this like a regular surgical mask, just a, a normal mask um, out in, you know, out on the unit when you're not in a room. Um, after that, then she's been told you can, and then she was told them you have to. So um, things have just been changing a lot. Um, so this has been an effort, like I've seen a lot of people are getting behind this, uh, this effort, and that has really been great. And a lot of times. Um, so on my wife's unit in the critical care setting, uh, since it is like an, it is, a, it can be a, it's a big part of it is the airborne part of COVID mm -hmm. um, is they're using it a lot for, it's called intubation. So that's when somebody gets a breathing tube put in. Um, that's where, I'm not trying to be graphic, but that's where a lot of fluids and membrane. You won't show it. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, that's where a lot of times all that stuff can come fly in and, and just be more exposed. And then, so that's when the tube goes in and then they should be wearing these when the tube goes out. Um, this is for a, pers a person that then is called intubated. So then once they're intubated and they have that breathing tube in, then it's most of the time, like, you know, a closed circuit unless they become disconnected, which then they plug right back in. But um, so, yeah, so I think this has been a great effort. But like I said, um, Oh yeah, and then I just there was a comment here. They're especially useful when extubating a patient, and that's so true because, again, not just just trying to give you the facts of why they're using this is when you're pulling that breathing tube out, you're pulling saliva, you're pulling stuff out with it. So that's when really this can really 
um, you can really get in the air. So yes, thank you for that comment. Uh, but yeah, so I think that's kind of what we're seeing mostly, and that's kind of the best solution we've seen, uh, one that has been easily implemented by teams and by people that can can supply these. And um, Joe, I hope, you know, I, I don't know if Formlabs has specifically got in, into these these visor um, or these headbands for the visors, um, but I don't know if you can talk to that or, or what else you guys and have I, been doing. I know, Jerry, you have two at Stryker as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now go ahead, Joe. Um, so actually, I had just uh, I had forgotten to send you a link uh, beforehand, but there is a uh, a first website. Uh, I'm sorry, a COVID nineteen uh, uh, response uh, where they're like, okay, if you have one of our three D printers, they uh, they give you a um, uh, like here are some things you can print, and one of them are these. They're they they hold these shields, and there there's a like a a tube that blows air down on them to to keep like to make like an air curtain in addition to just the plastic it's it's uh it's sort of like an entire system so anyway there's a uh uh we're gonna have to put a link in somewhere afterwards or something because there is a it's a uh I'll, I'll i'll uh send you the link when i uh when i'm not talking is this so, one here that i'm bringing up actually uh covid nine response if you scroll down right there's a place that's like hey you can, this is what you who are, uh, uh, it talks about our, our, our uh, uh, there's a spot on here where it's like, this is if you have one of our printers, here are some things that you can print that are actually useful for uh, sure. people. That, this is quite you know, the landing so, page here, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's, a, there's a section on here that's the slash you can help or something like that. Sure. I don't remember the exact uh, thing, but it, it you're, from this page, you can get to a page where they have like a half a dozen sort of like some of them are quite simple. Some of them are more complicated, but there are various things that if you don't have to sterilize, the, the big problem is having sterilized the big and, and having things that can actually uh, be safe to be in constant contact with human skin. So there are it's a little limiting, but uh, there are some things that you can print if you have access to a form three printer. And I'm sure some of them uh, could also be printed on uh, on other printers as well. So, um, so anyway, that's uh, just uh, the the um, if you're looking for things to help, there are some right. like clearing houses for like these are things that people can actually use. Um, I also, you know, I don't I don't want to minimize the uh, the work that people are doing trying to help because there's like there's a team aspect of this of like we all are on the team. Let's humans, you know, beat this virus. Right. You know, there's a there are examples of during World War II in England, they had like metal drives where people were mm -hmm. were collecting metal to, uh, yeah. you know, to help win the war. Yeah. That in in most cases didn't actually go into like making airplanes or the things that people were using. But there was a psychology of I'm helping win the war, and so I don't want to completely minimize that there isn't some social aspect to you know, thinking about and trying to help and doing things, even if they aren't directly going right to the, you know, onto the firing line. But I, I think people should have some realistic expectations about, mm -hmm. you know, what they're going to be able to do if your materials can't be autoclaved, if they can't be proven to be made from materials that are biocompatible, even if they're probably biocompatible, like that isn't the standard that our hospitals are working at. And, and, uh, and so it's going to be really hard to, uh, you know, in the, in, unless it gets to like every man for himself sort of a environment that uh, we're we're just we're going to continue to to figure out ways of using FDA approved or maybe FDA approved with some you know some quick action to be maybe a little bit less stringent on this or that test or something. But it's I, I think we're, we're we're expecting a lot to think that high school first teams are going to be making. You know, uh, FDA approved uh, uh, personal protection equipment. So uh, I just want to chime in, though, things. is one of the things, yeah. though, is I think I don't think it's that we're expecting first teams to do it. I think first teams set their own expectations on yeah. those yeah. things. And I think they put a lot of social pressure on themselves uh, to to like they see one team doing it or they see one thing out there like, oh, my God, I got to I got to assemble and start doing things and just yeah. put the in that. I think that anxiety, you know, there's so much anxiety right now. Uh, building up right now that I think people see teams doing things are like, well, what happens if I don't do something? 
And yeah. it, you know, I, and I think that's something we can also talk about in a little bit too. I do want to bring in Jerry, uh, talk about the, uh, the face shields and stuff, but I think something afterwards we'll talk about are what are some things maybe teams should be staying away from as well too, yeah. uh, as they go through. But Jerry, I'd love to hear more about the uh, face shields at striker as well. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's, it's not a surprise. Uh, all the teams want to do something. And once the season was canceled, our kids are like, Hey, we got to do something. Mm-hmm. And our advice was okay. Yep. Yep. But identify a real clinical problem, you know, make sure it's a real problem, then identify how you're going to solve it and answer the questions. Can we do it in enough volume? Can we do it fast enough? Uh Can we, you know, get this done? What's the regulatory process? Verify that your plan can actually make a difference. That beats doing something and feeling good. That's never going to make a difference. Right. And so our kids, and, and we ground this in them and it, you know, we have a little advantage here. A number of us that mentor the team work at Stryker, and this is our day job. We're, we're immersed <laughs> in all this stuff, so we know how some of this works. But we, we uh, challenged them, and they uh, ended up coming up. They uh, found an, out in the open source world a uh, design out of Europe. I think it was out of Stockholm, Sweden, um, for a uh, – you print a visor and then a uh, uh, basically a transparency. You punch some holes in a transparency and snap it on there. And we're like, okay, we can do that. And uh, and decide, all right, we did the math. We can make 100 of these a day. We can print 100 a day, and it's easy enough to print the uh, to punch out the transparencies. So we started doing that. We made a few. We got them to some nurses that work at Stryker, said, give us advice. We then took them to a local hospital and said, give us some advice. We then evolved this substantially. Um, there was a lot of back and forth evolved it, said, okay, we now think we have something. We started printing them, and the hospital loved them. They had seven different designs that had been submitted from different companies, and they said, Strike Force, we like yours. Can we get more? Well, yeah, we, we can print 100 a day. No, we were thinking about 10,000. <laughs> so, um, okay, yeah, and this would be really helpful? Yes. All right, so what we did with the kids is, all right, well, you're about to learn how you go into mass production. <laughs> so we, we called up a, a local, local mold house and said, hey, can you guys help us? Only way to do this is injection mold them. And in four days, we went from the first conversation to they started cutting the tooling for an injection mold. And seven days after that, we will be injection molding these visors because we can't print them fast enough. Mm-hmm. And then we'll make 4,000 a day. Mm-hmm. And right now, we actually have folks that have asked for 16,000 of these. And we're really setting up to probably manufacture up to 100,000. Oh, and this wow. is a robotics team. And, and the key thing is we pounded into the kids. You got to be thoughtful. How are we going to make a lot of these? Mm -hmm. And the visors are easy. We're buying transparencies, you know, literally thousands at a time, punching holes in them, clipping the corners. And that's your transparency that goes on there. And you've got this scale. And so, you know, this is, then this is advice. I give everybody figure out something you can do, something that matters that you can do fast enough in enough scale to impact and that's an example of what we're doing. It's to the point now where Stryker actually had trouble sourcing enough face shields out of industry to give to all of our field-based employees. Mm-hmm. And they're aware of what we're doing. And just last night, they called me up and said, hey, Jerry, yeah, those face shields, can we get some of those? Yeah. How many do you need? Well, we'd like to start with 4,000. And so, so literally, these kids are getting the education of life on what this is all about as just in a couple of weeks, we've gone from, ah, we'll print some of these to we're now talking about making a hundred thousand. So fascinating wow. journey, but that is the advice I would give any of the first teams do not make a ventilator. Mm-hmm. You know, a number of folks ask striker and we do this stuff for a living. You know, are you guys making ventilators? No, we don't know anything about ventilators. We're making beds and we're making PPE cause that's what we know how to do. Mm-hmm. You know, the auto companies are impacting a lot here. But they're not making ventilators from scratch. They are partnered with somebody who makes ventilators, and they're adding scale. So yeah. they bought. They bought, or effectively, they, they they started with the design that was already proven and read. Yeah. Anyway, this is a big, big, big difference. Yeah. Yep. And so you know, our kids got to see uh, Tyler. If you want to bring it up, we were printing these, and then if you're going to mold this, it's a whole different thing. And it's the picture with all the colors you know, suddenly you've got to do mold flow analysis. You're not printing these anymore. When you squirt the molten plastic in there, you've got to make sure these things are going to come out okay. So it's been really quite an education for everybody else going through this process. But we're excited and very proud of what we're doing here. 
Um, it's super cool to see. Yeah. I do want to ask, we do have some Q&A that I, I want to take. I know our time's starting to get a little bit short. Uh, so uh, uh, Can from, I add in before yeah. we get to Q&A? Just well, yeah, quick, I, and I just want to ask real quick, too, for anybody else. Is there anything that, uh, from advice-wise, we said, you know, don't be making ventilators. Is there anything else we need to be mindful of as well, too? And then go ahead, Mike. So it just kind of echoes the the video we did the other the other week or the other month, Tyler. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, if you, if your team doesn't have these resources, one, don't feel like you have to do anything at this time. Two, if if your team doesn't have these resources, there's still tons of other things that you can do for your community, for your healthcare workers, for your first responders, for your um, for your grocery store workers, stuff like that. Like. I've been just because I'm friends with a lot of nurses from all over the country and stuff, you know, so, you know, sending in catering for for a unit. Uh, maybe it's somebody, you know, maybe it's somebody you don't. Um, you know, there's a lot of these things. Um, if you can sew or crochet, there's people that are now wearing masks 12 plus hours a day really takes a toll on your ears. Um, so I don't know. They have these headbands that have like two buttons that are so sewed into the headband. So now you can. Put the put the little mask on those buttons instead of around your ears. Um, just stuff like that. There's little things else that you guys can do um, if you're really itching to do something um, that you can kind of think outside of the box a little bit and really, um, you know, just providing coffee, donuts, you know, all sorts yeah. of stuff for for those that are are in in the grind every day. There's, you know, my wife, you know, goes, you know, goes to work. I don't know. There's not. Much I do so if we do go out you know it's just really just seeing how we can be thankful to, to those in our community that um can't work from home that are really on the front lines for us mike if you didn't see the bdrs says if you're sending in catering please call first though yes yeah <laughs> i mean because you don't want to end up with like 25 pizzas because five people right or exactly yeah coordinate it with that's why if you could reach out to somebody you know oh hey i know a nurse in a unit yeah. uh be like let's let's have them talk to their man you know to their nurse manager when can we provide lunch for you know for your unit stuff like that so yeah um dr well, and that, that's exactly right you you identify the need whatever it may be verify the mm -hmm. need is there and then you go solve that problem mm -hmm. don't guess go find out so that's great advice yeah, yeah i agree uh, Dr. Dewar, is anything from you uh, to wrap up on this topic? Always, we're going to move into our Q and A. Um, I think let's jump to Q and A. I don't want to okay. cut people cut the audience short. Yeah, no worries. So, so we got about seven minutes here. So I want to, uh, for some of these, we might not get everybody for input on it, but I'll let whoever wants to take it uh, go, and then we can do some follow up. So, from Pork Roll Seven, uh, I'm going to read these all verbatim. By the way, uh, Pork Roll Seven says our team made a lot of face masks. Uh, do the panelists think it's worth continuing on doing this or what is the most valuable way to actually help? So they're making a lot of face masks. Should they keep making more or do, should they do some more verifications? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to assume that they're, they're making face masks, not face shields. Um, and the FDA actually has got some pretty good guidance out of it, you know, and don't try to make an N95 mask. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a whole different kettle of fish. But a cloth face mask, there's actually some pretty good guidance out of, okay, if you're going to make this at home with, with basic materials, here's how you do it to get the best impact you're going to get out of that. So that stuff's all over the web, so just make sure you follow that guidance. And, and that does matter. <laughs> all right, we have from uh, uh, Tetnagak says, uh, in your experience, if, ho if hospitals can use an autoclave to sterilize components of a face shield, will they? Um, they said they have a lead on 20,000 face shields in the Westchester, New York area. This is really difficult because it isn't a matter of opinion about whether or not something is autoclavable. I mean, can you, you, can you explain what that means, by the way? So autoclave is essentially uh, it's a temperature profile. It goes up at a certain rate. It holds it for a certain time and then goes back down. There may or may not be steam involved. There, there's a number of different protocols, but these the, the, uh, there are, have become standards that have to say that it isn't just something that you just do and, boy, I hope that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, that, that, that uh, makes it sterile. There are things you have to prove that it's going to actually sterilize. And um, I think that if it isn't already on some sort of approved list, it's going to be very difficult for people to, to say, yes, uh, let's wing it, let's just try this. I, I, I think... Uh, I think again, if it's if it gets to be a super emergency where you know we just, you know, it, you know this is like a field hospital sort of a situation. I think we might consider it, but I, I have a really hard time with uh, thinking that hospital administrators, and and what would would you want you know people you know using things where they're making it up if, or versus it, 
you know, this is something where I think the FDA applies the rules, and I think we're gonna we're gonna live with them until we can't. That's my uh, my view on it. Most face shields, unless they were certified for the autoclave, and virtually none of them are, are not going to survive. Mm -hmm. um, that is a very hostile environment designed to kill bugs. And yep. uh, if you don't design for it, they're, they're not going to survive. Um, yeah. And you really don't need your face shield to be sterilized. You really right. need it to be disinfected, which exactly. is two very different things. Yes. Yes. And that's the point of the, yeah, then kind of then full circle. That's the point of those is that those can be wiped down. There's different products, cavi wipes, you know, quote, bleach wipes, whatever that, that, that can be, you know, we do that all the time with products. Like, so if you have to go take in like somebody's like blood sugar, we wipe that machine down. So then th like that's clean. So then we can go bring it into another patient's room. So it's the same, t same idea with these face shields. Um, to protect that mask underneath so that that can be reused. But yes, yeah, so I don't think these but, these really don't need, have a need to be autoclaved. But I'll assure you that that machine that got wiped down has gone through a number of tests to prove that wiping it down actually doesn't leave any of the residual you know uh, bad things on it that would go from room to room. Right. And this is why it, it, it just... I'm not saying it's unthinkable. I'm just saying that that we have a lot of rules here, and this is one of those where I just... I think it's it's a minefield for trying to figure out how we could yeah. step around it. Yep. All right, we got to keep moving on here from Clairvoyant Lama says, uh, what's the difference between an FDA approved design and an NIH approved design? And does anybody know what NIH means? Because I National don't. Institute of Health. Sure. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't. I can't speak to that. The uh, uh, I can take a swing at it. The the FDA is basically certifying products, and there's several different pathways. There's something called a PMA and a 510K and a number of different pathways by which you get a product approved for use. And depending upon the level of risk is the pathway you have to go down. Um, what the FDA has done for COVID, and there's a document out there, and they have said, okay, for these class one low risk devices, for this emergency, we are going to allow you to proceed in this way. For example, these face shields that we made. Normally, if you're gonna make a face shield for the medical industry, there's a whole list of regulations you have to meet. There's a lot of stuff you have to do. The FDA said, because we had to go do this homework, that okay, during this emergency, for these low risk devices, if you're gonna make a face shield, you have to label what it is, you have to label the materials that contact the skin, and you have to provide instructions for use. If you do those three things, you're good. You're self-certified as long as we're in this emergency state. So it's go out and read those instructions and figure out what the guidelines are. But the FDA regulates all those things. You know, I believe when you look at all the certifications of the, the mass and the different flow rates, like the N95 is 95% of the particles, 3.3 uh, microns or less are captured. They're really specifying this is a technical bar you've got to be over to put this label on your product. Mm -hmm. So, all right, a couple more questions to go through uh, from uh, NLS uh, GRN says, as a team, how do you decide to fund a project of thousands of face shields? Uh, is it contracted at cost, supported via donors or mentors or students, or is this coming out of your season's budget? So I think, Jerry, is a good question for you. Yeah, no, that's that's right down the fairway. It's one thing when you plan to print maybe a thousand of these, you can afford to absorb that. When you're going to injection mold and make a hundred thousand of these, you're not going to absorb that. So, uh, you know, when the when the hospital said, "Hey, can you make ten thousand of these?" Yeah, we can probably figure out how to do that. Um, if we're going to do that, can you at least give us enough to cover the cost of that? Sure. We we can't dig that kind of a hole. And as it turns out, when you look at what we could produce them for, it cost it's less than half of any pathway the hospital could get anything if they could even find it. Mm -hmm. And so they said, this is a huge win. You guys can get this. We're happy to cover the cost. So don't be afraid to talk to the different hospitals and wherever, you know, and, and do not try to get rich. But if you mm -hmm. think you know how to do something and, and, and it's impacting, talk to them. They may be delighted to cover your cost if you can just execute it. They're busy mm -hmm. trying to save people. They need help. 
All right, I think that's going to wrap up for questions. Uh, do want to thank everybody for taking the time to go through. Thank you, audience, by the way, too, for the great questions uh, for these panels as well, too. Uh, so, of course, big thank you to Dr. Joe, Jerry, and Mike for taking the time to help uh, educate and inform uh, fun fans and first fans out there. Uh, we always do give a moment at the end of our shows to the, if we want to do any plugs or anything like that. So I'm just going to do it around the horn real quick. Anything you want to talk about uh, with yourselves, your teams, your companies, anything like that. Dr. Joe, let's start with you. Um. Uh, a plug that I guess I would like to make is uh, I personally am working on a product called Fuse that is a SLS printer, and uh, I think it's going to be a first game changer because I think we'll be able to print amazing things. So when we launch, uh, I hope you guys will look at Form Labs and uh, and uh, look at all the great things you could possibly build with this printer because. Uh, uh, I am so excited about it. Like I'm tingly now thinking about like all the great things <laughs> that we can do with this printer. So and it's, it, imagine like having, com, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, formlabs.com. Yeah. And, uh, look for the fuse printer and, uh, it's coming out very soon. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, how about you and, uh, strike force or striker? Well, first of all, I'm very, very proud of what Strikeforce achieved when you look at these uh, face shields. It's a pretty interesting program and, and hopefully it's going to make a difference. From a striker standpoint, as folks may have noticed, striker is increasingly present in the first community. And my plug here would be we do really cool stuff. If, if you as an engineer, scientist, business person, whatever, you want to wake up each morning and do things that's really, really cool and have a great career, look us up. We're a big growth company, need lots of folks. And our big reason to be involved in FIRST is we want you to work for us. So think about us as you think about careers. And Mike? Yeah, so, um, well, just mentioning Stryker, like I said, and now I've used a lot of Stryker products. When Tyler got to visit Stryker's facility in Michigan, I was very jealous. Um, <laughs> it's just, uh, it, it just from the, just from using the products, I know that Stryker is just a great company and they, it, they're just, they're rock solid. I love it. So yeah, um, not much for me, just, um, finishing up the semester here and, um, just want to thank, um, Joe and Jerry for coming on today. It was just great talking to you guys and just seeing, um, the two great companies that you guys work for and, uh, just offering uh, some insight of what you guys are doing every day. It was just really great to hear. Thank you. Um, I do want to bring a quick disclaimer real quick just to mention that uh, Striker has uh, sponsored many fun shows, but this is something that we are doing completely independent of that. Yeah. And we thought that Striker would just be a fantastic uh, guest. And uh, Jerry, really appreciate your time for that. And Dr. Joe, thank you for your time from 4Labs as well to just educate the community. And, and that's mm -hmm. where that came from as well, too. So uh, Fun Nation, don't forget, we still need your help to keep our independent content going. Uh, if you have even a dollar to help support our Patreon or that free Twitch Prime sub, go ahead and click that button. If you got a few bits, we really appreciate appreciate it. It helps us keep making content so we can stay loud, live, and independent. And, you know, a lot of people ask us, hey, you know, Striker occasionally sponsor you. PTC's coming before. How are you guys seeing loud, live, and independent? Well, guys, we make the content we want to make for things. We make the content that hopefully you want to enjoy for things. And when we say independent, it means we give you an independent option to express your voice, to express how uh, you want to see your first career expand and go more. And that's what we're interested in doing. And we make the content that we feel helps uh, be appropriate for that. Uh, so don't forget, lots of great stuff still coming up on fun f4 catathon 450 people just signed up for this uh so super cool 150 teams the most we ever had uh we can't wait to see those reveals in a couple weeks uh there's also the uh other uh catathon by ptc just want to give them a, a brief non-sponsored mention for that is that uh you can check out what they have going on and win thousands of dollars for your team uh more frc ftc's in tournaments team interviews, more is coming up on fun. So make sure you stick around uh, and check out uh, all the great content we have. Uh, you can follow us uh, on our discord. Uh, that's the best place to stay up to date and everything with fun, but you know, social media is Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Twitch, of course. Uh, next Tuesday, the fun leadership team, we're going to be going live on air for a little bit. Uh, they're doing open town hall. Uh, if you want to know about the future of fun, if you want to know about the direction we're going, why we're going that way. And if you have suggestions for us, things that we can do better for you to help serve you, the community better. We're all open ears for that. And we'll have some marbles on stream playing in the background uh, as well too. So love to hear from you as well. Want to give real quick brief shout outs to those who have stepped up uh, and supported fun in the last couple of days uh, with the, your subs or bits. Uh, CDF man with uh, 19 months of support. Uh, Elin, 23 months of support. RCAP, 16 months of support. BDR Raz, 26 months of support. 
Uh, Scotty Macron with three months of support. Deb Boy with four months of support and some bits coming in as well, too. Robot Guy 88 with a prime sub. Uh, Connor earlier with 2,000 bits. Thank you so much for that. Re7457, 10 months of support. Daryl Lycos, four months of support. Uh, Deb Boy with some more bits. Pork Roll coming in with some. Thank you, everybody, uh, for helping us create content. We love doing it and we'll do it for you. So, with that said, thank you once again to our panelists. Thank you to you for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Fun. Talk to you then. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.